let's jump into what is a UART with a focus on what is a UART inside of an FPGA. So UART stands for Universal Asynchronous Receiver Transmitter, and it's also known by a couple of the names that are pretty common like a serial port or a COM port or RS-232 or RS-45, RS-422 is another one. Those all mean the same thing. Um, and we're gonna talk about what exactly a UART is and why it's so, why it's used in a lot of different places. And the main reason why it's used everywhere is that it is very simple to use. And it's very useful for basic communication to a microcontroller, between a microcontroller and a computer, um, between a micro, uh, microcontroller and an FPGA, between an FPGA and a computer. It's a common interface just to send simple data back and forth between two interfaces. And um, maybe just talking briefly about some of the words. Um, asynchronous. Asynchronous means not clocked, so there's no clock involved in this interface. And receiver transmitter means it can be a receiver or a transmitter. Universal, I guess it's used in a lot of places. So there you go. Un universal asynchronous receiver transmitter. And this is basically what it looks like. Uh, so if this is your FPGA, you have a receiver, which is uh, these buffers indicate uh, either a transmitter or a receiver, depending on which direction they're pointing. So for this one here in the top right corner, this is a receiver. It's receiving data from some device. Maybe it's a microcontroller. Maybe it's a computer. Uh, through this one line here. And this line is just one you know, copper wire between two points. Uh, similarly, it can transmit data back to the, to the device, back to the computer, back to the microcontroller through this wire here. So there's a receive interface, there's a transmit interface. This is just one example of what this might look like. Maybe you only want to send data from a microcontroller to an FPGA, in which case you don't need the bottom one at all. Or maybe you only want to send data from the FPGA to the computer. In this case, you don't need the top one. This is also called a full duplex interface, what I've drawn here. Full duplex just means that you can send and receive at the same time because there's actually two pieces of copper that you can transmit and receive on. So you could also do a half duplex interface if you want, which is, you know, th imagine that triangle can point one direction, but you can also flip it to point the other direction. Then you can receive and transmit on the same piece of wire. That's a half duplex interface. I actually just made another video about full versus half duplex. So you can check that out if you're curious to learn more about that. But um, so, you know, basically it's, it's a simple communication interface just requiring one or two pieces of copper, uh, two wires between your, your devices. So you know, low pin count, um, a little bit slow, but since there's no clock involved, you can just use one pin to send and receive data. So let's go into a little more detail about how it works. There's some configuration parameters that a UART needs to set up correctly. Now, since there's no clock involved, um, again, it's an asynchronous interface, meaning no clock. Um, there is uh, both the receiver and the transmitter need to agree on what's called the baud rate or the bits per second or the frequency of communication, if you will. It's basically like, how quickly am I going to talk to you? And if the receiver and the transmitter don't agree, um, the, the transmitter may be talking very quickly and the receiver is expecting it to talk slowly, then the data corruption and you're not going to you're going to get garbage, you're going to get jumbly jumbles. So um, the first important thing is that the baud rate needs to be set the same on the receiver side and the transmit side. And if that's not the same, you're out of luck. Um, again, that's bits per second. So 9600 baud, 9600 bits per second. Not very fast. Like the low end of a, of a UART interface is pretty slow. However, when it first came out, that was, that was enough. I mean, I remember when I was growing up, you used to use a dial-up modem to connect to the internet at 9,600 bits per second. So that was the stone age. You know, loading an image would take you a minute. Um, you really had to be patient. Not like today's kids. Anyway, um, they they do go faster than this. 115200 is a pretty common speed. Um, it can go all the way up to like one megabit per second. But after that, you kind of start to have problems with um, the data integrity getting slightly corrupted. So UART is simple, but it's not intended to go very fast. So if you need to go faster, other interfaces you might be looking at would be like an SPI interface can go into the megahertz. Um, a USB interface can definitely go faster. Ethernet, PCI, those are other interfaces just to give you some other ideas, things to look at if you need to have more data. And you know, it's all about how much data do you need to get through the pipe at once. Um, but, but again, UART is simple and it's for a lot of purposes, it's great. 
Uh, the next most common configuration parameter is the number of data bits, and I'll go into this, but I've never seen an interface with seven data bits. It's always been eight. Um, eight, eight bits in a byte. Why would you use seven? I don't know. Um, I've never seen seven used in real life, so that's something you can basically set to eight and never think about again. Parity bit, there's, there's something called parity, um, which can be either on or off. I've seen both. I say usually parity is off. It's really not super great. Um, parity basically is like a, an extra dit flag that tells you whether or not your data is good. Uh, it's on the it's the very last uh, bit of a byte because again it's an eight bit inter an eight eight bits being transmitted at, in one at once, and the very last bit can be a parity bit. Um, if it, and what it does is it it's just used for data integrity checking, um, and I won't go into the details of how exactly that works just yet. Uh, there can also be stop bits associated with this interface, and I'll show you a diagram of what this looks like, but almost always one stop bit is used. I've, I don't even think I've ever seen zero or two. And then something called flow control is also something you can set up. Um, that, again, not super common. This is like an older interface that probably has a lot of history associated with some of these things. Maybe these parameters were changed a lot um, in, the, in the 80s or 90s, perhaps. Um, but I'm almost, I've almost never seen flow control being used. It's a way to, um, if two interfaces are talking at each other, to basically control collisions on the line. Again, it's like if you have a half duplex interface, how do you control who's talking? Flow control can help with that. Most interface, interfaces are full duplex, so you have dedicated receive and transmit paths, and flow control is just not needed. So usually just ignore that one too. Here we go. So this is what a data stream looks like. Um, Again, it's a single wire. So the wire idles high. So this is a logic one uh, inside your FPGA. If you're the receiving side, by default, it's high. When, some, when this line goes low and stays low for the bit period, then that's called the start bit. There's always one start bit at the beginning of a data of, of, the, of a byte transaction. So I want to send the I want to send a byte. I want to send you know hex a d or something like that. Um, so I will tell the UART okay I'm going to send here, I'm going to send a d and it'll automatically generate this start bit. The UART uh, interface will automatically do this and then it will load whatever byte you asked for into this uh, one bit at a time into the serial stream. So this is you know if you're looking at time this is you know uh, early this is later. Um, so as things progress, this is what's being happening. Bit zero gets sent first. So this is an LSB interface, least significant bit first goes out on the UART line. So for one bit period, again, depending on your baud rate, the line will be driven to either a zero or a one to, for your first bit. You hold that on the line, all right. Now you take the next bit that you wanna transmit, hold that on the line for your bit period all right, go to the next one, go to the next one until you're done with your entire 8-bit byte. At the end, you will send, in this case, uh, there is no parity being used, so there's no parity bit here. And so the line will just send one stop bit. Again, almost always one stop bit. Stop bit just means the line goes high for one guaranteed bit period. Great, you sent a byte. Congratulations. Um, you can chain these transactions together to send multiple bytes back to back to back. So you can imagine that if you took this exact stream and you copied it uh, behind after the stop bit of this one, you could start another data stream uh, to send the next byte. So you imagine a serial data stream of just you know, transitions on this line, the start bit indicates the beginning of the transaction, the stop bit's the end of the transaction, and you just can sample the data and recover the, whatever you're trying to, whatever you're trying to data you're passed back and forth. Um, so, when the actual implementation of this, you know, the way these usually work is since there's no clock, uh, talk a little bit about sampling. Like it's basically like how often am I is the FPGA looking at this data to to figure out if it's a zero or a one. So the very first thing that it's going to do is it's going to look for this falling edge of the start bit. It's going to be it's going to see a one. It's going to sample it. There's a one there. Sample it again. Still one. Sample it again. Still one. And then it's going to sample it here. It's going to go, oh, ooh, it's zero now. Wow, that's fun. Um, this maybe is a UART transaction. Sample, sample, sample. Let's say it stays zero for a while. All right, good. This is this is legit. This is real. Let's get let's get excited. We're going to be receiving a byte. Um, so then it looks for the. It'll actually align itself to the middle of the data bits. And the way it does this is, it'll count. It when it sees this edge, it'll count to the middle of what it thinks 
uh, the data bit is based on the baud rate that you have set previously. So if you're at 9600 baud, it would use um, a larger amount of time than if you set 115200 baud and it would count less um, to get you aligned to the middle. The reason you want to be aligned to the middle is because if you're sampling at this edge, on, like let's say you're sampling just when the data is changing, you can actually have what's called metastability, where you can't guarantee if, if you're sampling a zero, am I sampling a one, the, the, the receiver can get confused. So you really want to maximize your data integrity, and the way you do that is you sample, when the, you sample it when the data has been the most stable for the most amount of time and unchanging, right? It's not going to, so where is, it, where is it unchanging? It's unchanging the most in the middle. Um, you know, if you think about this, this is, these are analog voltages changing a 0 to 3.3 volts or whatever interface you're using that they have to go from 0 volts to some other volt voltage um, and that's, that takes some time to do that. So you don't want to be sampling when the data is transitioning, you want to sample when it's rock solid right in the middle of the data bit. So that's important. Um, and that's that's how the receiver basically works. Again, there can be something called a parity bit which is inserted here after bit 7. Um, and the parity bit is, uh, I won't go into the details of how the parity bit works, but it's its an XOR operation. So it does the exclusive OR of every data bit. And if it's, um, if it's, if the parity bit is not, uh, does not match what the receiver calculates, then the receiver has the ability to like throw the byte away or flag it as a questionable byte. It's basically like an extra data integrity check. You can't do much with it and it's kind of crappy to be honest so i don't use it um important ascii ascii is very commonly used in the language of sending data back and forth over the uart so if you want to send data from a computer you know you have a keyboard in front of you i have a keyboard here it looks like that um you know, if you want to send data to an FPGA, to a microcontroller, how do you send the letter U? How do you send the, the, the dollar sign? What is that? Um, that's called ASCII. The way that works is uh, through this standard that came out in like, I don't know, 60s or something. It's very old. 50s? It's old. Um, and it's, it's basically a way to encode all of the common letters and numbers that you would see on a standard keyboard and some other ones that you've probably never seen before. So it starts off with ones that are really weird. Um, I don't know if you can read this or not, but uh, let's see what, out of here, which ones are important? Uh, D, hex, so there's a decimal number, there's a hex number, so those are just representations of the same value in different base systems. Um, and then there's like some indicator of what this is, CR, carriage return, that's like hitting enter on your keyboard does a carriage return. Uh, that one's important because um, that gets used when you hit enter. There's also a line feed somewhere. I think it's 10. Yeah, uh, A. So line feed is a new line whenever whenever you hit that. Um, the rest of these ones I don't ever use. They're not important. Um, at least, oh no, backspaces. Okay, backspace is a good one. But other than that, I don't usually use those. Um, over here, the common ones are like 30, 31, 32, 33, 34, hex. Those correspond to 0, 1, 2, 3, 4. You would think 0 on your keyboard would be like hex 0, but that's not the way this works. 30 is hex 0. And I'm going to do a demo and show you that in a second. Um, and then there's different letters for like a capital K is different from a lowercase k, if you think about it. Capital K is 4B, lowercase, B, a lowercase k is 6B. So they're offset by 20 hex uh, from each other. So uh, that's what the ASCII is, and the reason I'm going to show you that is because I have a demo. So this is the Go board running here, and what's happening, I'm going to cover up this LED, is it's connected to my computer so that when I type in a character using my keyboard, it will send that character through this COM port, through this cable that I have hooked up to the Go board, through a receiver into the FPGA. The FPGA will sample the line, look for the start bit, sample the eight data bits, look for the stop bit, and then once it decodes that byte, it'll send that byte to this seven segment display here and show both hex digits of whatever ASCII character or whatever keyboard character I hit. So let's do a, let's do a demo, let's do K, let's start with K. What did I say K was? 40B, 6, 6B, lowercase k, 6B, yeah, that's right. So there you go, 6B. Now if I hold shift and hit K again, I hope it says 4B, look at that. 
So or lowercase k, uppercase k, boom. There you go. How about zero? What did I say zero was? 30, right? 30, let's, let's count. 31, 32, this is two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. You can spam stuff. Make it make the seven segment display dance. So every single character I hit on my keyboard is changing the seven segment display to represent its ASCII value. Pretty cool stuff. So this is a demo of the UART working. That's an A. Um, uh, I will go into more detail in future videos, uh, the next video about uh, the implementation of this. So how do you write FPGA, Verilog, and VHDL code to actually do what you're seeing here? So stay tuned for that. Hey, I'll just wanted to jump in at the end of this video real quick to say, please check out patreon.com forward slash Nandland and consider supporting me there. I would really appreciate it. It helps me cranking out these good tutorials and these videos. So if you found this valuable, uh, consider heading over to Patreon and supporting me. Keep me making good content. Uh, in addition to that, please consider getting yourself a Go board so you can actually program this code and try it out on real hardware. They're available at nanland.com. And thanks for your support.